Welcome everyone and good morning and thank you for coming out this morning as we unveil the latest edition of the Life Report. The Life Report began 20 years ago in an effort of the United Way to bring the community together. And it had three main objectives. One was to acknowledge the strengths of the community. Second was to identify community challenges. And third, and probably most importantly, was to serve as a catalyst for change by advancing community conversations and partnerships around the calls to action. Some of the things that the Life Report has identified as major needs in our community, uh, early childhood development, domestic abuse, housing and homelessness type issues, I think it's allowed us to be more proactive. The Life Report has been a tool that we will reference or our grantees will list as reasons why they're seeking funds. Marathon County has done an excellent job of coming together to address community issues. By doing a community assessment where the community and multiple stakeholders within the community come together and say, this is what's important to Marathon County. These are the areas that we need to look at. As a hospital, we can target exactly what the community feels like they want and need, and we can invest in areas that are gonna provide the greatest uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. When resources are pooled and the efforts are coordinated, it creates a synergy that enhances the effectiveness of the overall effort. And to me, that's one of the biggest benefits of the Life Report. To learn more or get involved, go to unitedwaymc.org. Well, again, welcome this morning. Thank you for coming out on this uh, somewhat chilly morning. Thank you for your interest in the community as we unveil the latest edition of the Life Report. We want to start off by taking a few minutes and to provide you an overview of the Life Report. When you leave here this morning, you'll be able to pick up a, a copy of that along with a snapshot of the report. This is the 20th anniversary of the Life Report, which means that this is the 10th report that's been done. And uh, this is a relatively unique effort. There are some other communities that do reports of this type, but we're not aware of anyone that has done something like this over this long of a period of time. So I think in that regard, it makes it somewhat unique. And I think we can serve as uh, a model for other communities to follow. Take a moment and think back 20 years to the year 1995. Life was a bit simpler then, I think. Uh, we certainly did not have the resources available then either. We didn't have the internet as a resource as we have it available to us today. And over time, the report has really come into its own. And over time, the exposure of it has grown and the support for it has grown. <clears throat> and it's now viewed as a very valuable resource some might even say indispensable in helping our community to identify priorities, set priorities, and award uh, grant funding. Uh, Dolores Clancy, are you out there? No, okay. Well, Dolores Clancy was the first chair of the Life Committee. And from, wow, excuse me. From 1996 through 2008, she chaired the committee and oversaw the production of the first six life reports. And I think it was through her leadership and the leadership of many others and the involvement and support of many that the report has grown into what it is today. Speaking of, um, speaking of uh, support, before we go any further, we need to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, without whom this effort would not be possible. We have a total of 18 sponsors the 11 full partners are listed up there on the screen, most of whom have been with the project for the full 20 years. There are also um, five general sponsors and two supporters. And this effort is a great example of the amazing things that can be done when we come together and each contribute a little to make this happen. So please join me in a round of applause for our sponsors.
We also want to acknowledge all of the volunteers who provide countless hours of their time in doing this work. Our structure includes uh, a steering committee, uh, the members of whom are listed in the report, uh, and six subcommittees, one for each section. And in total, there's uh, over 80 uh, volunteers were involved in making this report a reality. I want to call out uh, two people in particular, Greg Wright. Greg, are you here this morning? Uh, Greg served as our project manager and our lead author on the report. Uh, he's been with us now the second time around. Uh, he was also here for the last report. And I also want to recognize uh, our vice chair, Karen Katz. Uh, this past year, I had a job assignment which took me out of town uh, most of the week for nine months. And it was great having Karen there. You stepped right in, never missed a beat, and kept everything going. I really want to acknowledge you for that, Karen. Thank you very much. I also want to uh, acknowledge the United Way itself. Uh, throughout this time, it has served as the host agency and the lead project facilitator. And I want to acknowledge Joanne Kelly, the executive director of the United Way, uh, Joanne is the one that keeps us on track. She's sort of the backbone of the whole effort, and she's the steady force behind all of the effort that goes into, uh, into this. So, Joanne, thank you very much for your leadership as well. The United Way works to understand priorities and convenes people and organizations to work together on these issues. And the United Way's role is critical to the report's success, and without their involvement, this thing would not exist. There are some new things in the report this year, uh, not the least of which is the videos. You saw the introductory video, and in addition to that, there are five, one covering each priority, and then one for each section of the report. The videos are about two minutes in length, just under that. And at the end of the program, we will show you uh, where you can view them. In addition to the videos, uh, you'll find a color uh, version of the report online. So if you would like a, a color copy of that, you can access it online. And then additionally in this report, we've really tried to call out the interrelatedness of these issues to one another. As, as you look at these issues, you see that almost none of them stand on their own. They all have some interrelation uh, to the other issues that are included in the report. And because of this, um, we have used these series of icons throughout the report this year to denote where these issues cross over and, and the topics cross over and are interrelated with one another. There are again six main sections of the report. Each has a cover page with an infographic and a big picture perspective on the topic. The back side of the cover page provides information on the section's success and progress, the calls to action, and the opportunities for action for individuals, organizations, and the community. One of the purposes of the report, of course, is to acknowledge the community strengths. These are listed on page 21 of the report, and we've organized these into three broad categories. First is our resource richness, and whether we're talking about the quality of our school systems, the quality of our healthcare systems, or the quality of our natural resources, we are truly rich in resources in this part of the state. Secondly is that the greater Wausau metro area serves as a regional center for employment, shopping, and tourism. And third, and I think perhaps most important, is the ability of our community to build coalitions. And being able to marshal all of our collective resources to attack these issues of concern to us is truly a community strength. In addition to the four top calls to action, which we'll cover momentarily, we also noted an issue to watch, which was that of aging. And at this time, we're going to view uh, the aging video. Our community's changing demographics will require a greater understanding of the issues facing our aging population. We need to prepare now for what is coming. At some point in the very near future, there will be more people over the age of 65 than children under 5. 
People are living a lot longer, and so they're often outliving their savings. 57% of our life respondents said they're really worried about how to afford their long-term care when they reach that point. For persons over the age of 65, they watch an average of 47 hours of TV a week. That's seven hours a day. Think of the opportunity that we could have as a community to offer experiences, education, exercise, volunteerism in support of our community with those seven hours a day times the number of people we have in our community. Seniors are looking for things to do. It really just is almost like knitting the community together when you bring seniors to help solve the issues of the community. A lot of our seniors want to be engaged. I think everybody needs a sense of purpose. I think they want to volunteer. We will benefit as a community when we provide opportunities that encourage an active, healthy lifestyle, embrace the values seniors have to offer, and are prepared to respond to their needs. To learn more or get involved, go to unitedwaymc.org. Okay, this slide depicts our top four calls to action. And as the diagram depicts, they are all intertwined. They are all of a long-term nature where it can take years uh, to see progress made. And very importantly, I want to emphasize that these are very, very complex issues with no simple, single solution to any one of them. And they all impact what was identified two years ago as our long-term priority, which is a great start for kids. Mental health is perhaps the most fundamental of these in terms of having an impact on the remaining issues. There is a stigma associated with it. It's very pervasive. It cuts across all socioeconomic classes, but perhaps has the most significant impact on those of lower economic status. But there are signs of hope and encouragement in addressing this issue. Two recent examples include the uh, Gannett Wisconsin Media Series, which uh, first was uh, included in the January 10th edition of the Wassa Daily Herald, termed Kids in Crisis. It involves 25 uh, Gannett reporters from across the state, and they're calling attention to children's mental health issues. They're doing a great job of increasing awareness and education on this topic, which is where we have to start to address this. And then secondly, in the current edition of the City Pages, uh, there's an article that features the steps being taken to address mental health needs of jail inmates, which, which is an acute problem. Substance abuse. This covers both alcohol and drug abuse. We identified this as an issue of immediate concern in the last report, and it has unfortunately now elevated itself to one of the top four calls to action. And at this time, we'll view the video on this topic. Marathon County continues to face challenges pertaining to alcohol and illegal and prescription drugs. Substance abuse crosses all socioeconomic backgrounds. Huh? We've seen prominent business persons that have been involved in the product and have sacrificed their businesses, their careers, just because of the addiction. When you look at any social event that takes place in this community, Usually alcohol is served at those particular events, and it's a draw. When a teenager drinks alcohol, they have a six to eight times greater chance of becoming addicted to alcohol because of the brain not being fully developed. Unfortunately, in Wisconsin, it's legal for parents or guardians to give alcohol to their underage children. We know that addiction it can be genetic, but it also can be learned behaviors. Substance abuse is a huge issue. 75% of those persons that are booked into the Marathon County Jail are there for some type of substance abuse problem, whether it be from sale or trafficking to committing offense while under the influence of a particular product or committing an offense to support a habit or an addiction. It doesn't matter what the person is using, you have to understand why they're using. So I think that's the number one thing that we have to tackle. Understanding and openly discussing both drugs and the more accepted use of alcohol will be a step toward changing the culture. To learn more or get involved, go to unitedwaymc.org. And income. 
Income is the issue where the first two, mental health and substance abuse, are perhaps manifested the most as they affect an individual's ability to obtain and hold a job. And to illustrate the interrelatedness of these issues, in the survey, the number one reason given for someone not seeing a mental health provider was their, they had no means to pay for it. So you can see how these relate to one another. And then, of course, at the center of all of this are the kids. In the last report, our long-term call to action was to ensure that every child in Marathon County gets off to a great start. And in order to achieve this, we must first understand the obstacles that are likely to prevent this. The presence of these issues in the home, of course, affects this and affects the ability of the child to develop into a healthy, productive member of the community. Our keynote speaker today will address these issues and their effects on the child. And he may be familiar to those of you who were here two years ago for the last report's presentation. Depeche Navsaria holds a Master's of Public Health, a Master's of Library Science, is an MD and a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Navsaria is a pediatrician, occasional children's librarian, public health professional, and child health advocate. Additionally, Dr. Navsaria is strongly engaged with early literacy programs in healthcare settings, particularly around ideas of early brain and child development, which include neurobiological effects of adversity and poverty upon the developing brain. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Navsaria. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight to be here again. I, uh, I have to say I was a little surprised to be asked to come back for the next life report um, two years later. I, I do have one key suggestion for the committee, which is could you release this report at a warmer time of year? So <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to start associating it with cold every time. So um, oops, the slides are closed here. Um, again, thank you for having me here. Again, I want to I point out how delightful it is that there's so many people here and so many people involved in things like the Life Report. Um, it's, it's not simply hubris that leads to the, the statement here that, gee, you know, there, not many communities do this. To take a comprehensive look at what goes on um, around Uh, to take a comprehensive look at what goes on in your community across um, multiple areas and multiple fields is really something that's not done as often as it should be. Uh, you know, these, these issues are complex. They are interrelated in so many different ways, and we'll touch on that in, uh, in a variety of uh, ways as we go through things here. So um, as I was reading, I was given an advanced copy of the Life Report, and as I was reading through it, I started to recognize that Okay, there's lots of wonderful statistics. There's lots of great concepts and lots of ideas there. But one kind of phrase kept on resonating as I went through it, which was the concept of two generations. And I'll explain what I mean by that in, in more detail in just a moment. And that's what I'm going to focus my comments on today, because I, I'm not here to tell you about your community. This is, this is your community. You know it far better than I do. But what I'm hoping to do is to put a frame on what you'll see when you look at the life report and what you see when you look at prior life reports and try to say, okay, what's, what's the big current flowing underneath all of this? What's the big ideas and what are the types of approaches that we can think about conceptually so that we can have a more effective way to address the needs that are here in, in the community? So I'll oops, turn that on here. Um, I'll start off with, uh, again, you just saw the calls to action here, and I won't you know, go over them in great detail again, but again, first you had this concept of mental health. And I want to say that we, we tend to think of mental health in this sort of negative frame, right? The people who need help, the people who are suffering from mental health issues, and so on. But we also need to think about it as mental health, right? We all have some form of mental health, hopefully good mental health. 
So we need to also think about how do we maintain that good mental health and how do we prevent issues to the extent we can um, from, from becoming problems later on. Because we know that that affects not just us as individuals, but it affects the family unit, it affects our, our workplace, and it affects our community as a whole. Sub substance abuse is very tied into this. Sadly, the inability to obtain mental health sometimes leads to what we call, you know, in a strange way, self-medication. And it's not so much that people are saying, hmm, I have depression and I think I'm going to take this since I can't get, get in to see someone to prescribe antidepressants. It's, wow, this helps me get away from this and maybe in not such a good way, but it helps me get away from, getting, uh, from feeling this way. And then that cycle perpetuates itself as well. So the two are really tied together so deeply that you, you can't really extricate them from one another. And then you heard about the role of income. Now the interesting thing is that this cuts both ways, of course. When you don't have a good income, good benefits, health insurance, et cetera, you can't get the substance abuse treatment you need. You can't get the mental health treatment you need. But likewise, when you have substance abuse and mental health problems, it affects your income. It affects your ability to keep a job. It affects your ability to keep relationships. And so on and so forth. So it's really a two-way street when it comes to that. And of course, in the middle of all this is the great start for kids. Because kids are reliant on adults. They're reliant on the adults in their home, and they're reliant on the adults around them who take care of them in child care centers and other locations in order to get those brain circuits wired. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the concept of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and if you're not, I'm gonna, I'll very briefly explain. But I find myself thinking about this a lot. Uh, Maslow was a psychologist who said, we have this hierarchy of needs as human beings. And, and he felt this was true just about anywhere, you know, that this is true of all humans, irrespective of culture and so on. And he said, the very basics, what you see up there at the bottom, are, are like you, you have to have that no matter what, right? So the most basic need, oxygen, right? You need air. You need to be able to breathe, OK? Otherwise, you, you're not going to last more than three or four minutes. So he said, you need that, then you need water, then you need food, um, you need to be able to sleep, you need to be able to do all sorts of different things just to fulfill those basic physiologic needs. Okay, so we start with that. Then what's the next level up? It's safety and security. Now the funny thing is, we know from the number of children that are affected by violence and so on that, you know, gee, safety and security is just a second level up. You know, these are kids who are worried and fearing for their own, you know, safety. They're being abused, they're being neglected, all those sorts of things. Wow, we're only up on the second level just to think about, do I feel safe? Do I feel secure in a key way? And then you move on to love, belonging, feeling that you're part of a family unit or a group um, and have relationships that can help support what you're doing. And then, self, and then goes to esteem and then finally self-actualization. Can you actually do creative things can you have a moral sense, a moral sense of purpose, a sense of this is what I want to do with my life, this is, the, this is the change I want to make in the world? Think about what happens when you're constantly worried about the things at the base of the pyramid. If you're worried about where food is going to come for you or your family that night, you're not even really thinking about the safety and security as emphatically as you might want to. And you're certainly not thinking deeply ahead about concepts like, what am I going to do with my life? How am I going to make a difference in the world? And, and so on. So this hierarchy of needs concept, I think, is very important when thinking about families that are under siege by what life is throwing at them, and children who are under siege, and parents who are under siege, because they would like to do these things. They'd like to get up to the top part of that pyramid. But when you're constantly operating down here, you can't get out of that, and you go for the short-term solution the short-term fix, like substance abuse, like yelling at your kid that day, you know, like kicking the wall or punching the wall, or whatever the case may be, because that's all you can reach for because you can't see the path out later on. You might remember from two years ago, there was a few things I shared with you about children and about child development. And I'm, I'm going to briefly just review a few of those things to kind of bring them back into the forefront of your minds. Remembering that child development is a foundation for community and economic development, that this is an infrastructure need the same way 
that we have infrastructure needs around highways and buildings and water and whatnot, waterworks and so on, that we're thinking about brain infrastructure because this is the future for society. These are our future citizens. We need to be thinking about early brain infrastructure. It's not that tangible thing that you can point at like you can a highway, but it's just as important, if not more important, because we need those kids to be the backbone of our, of our society. The other thing I shared with you was this notion of interaction and this notion of the importance of relationships. That there's two things that really say, how does the brain wire? How does it connect together? And that's your genes, right? You've got to have that programming for how those neurons are connecting up to one another. But you also have experiences that drive the spe specifics about how those neurons are wiring and what circuits are being emphasized versus those that are not. And if we had to pick out what is it that makes the difference, what is it that says we're going to wire for those long-term skill sets, those higher level things on, on the hierarchy of needs and those sorts of things, it's going to be through responsive relationships with those around, kind of like in tennis, that serve and return, that back and forth. So when that child is just minutes, hours, days old, and they're looking up at their, at their parent or an adult or whoever, and they look, and the parent smiles at them. And they learn over time to responsively smile back. That's serve and return. And then the baby learns when they smile, the adult smiles back. That's the very beginnings of understanding, hey, I can count on something in this world. I can count on someone to respond in this predictable way. And those two neurons plug together. But what happens if that parent isn't there to do that? There might be a few reasons for that. They might be profoundly depressed. When someone is depressed, they often have a flat affect. It's really hard to get them to smile or respond, or it's a real struggle for them to do so. And my goodness, there's so many parents who suffer from depression and still manage to get those smiles out because they know how important it is, even while they struggle. Or the parent who's under the influence of a substance because it helps them cope with the fact that they got yelled at and threatened with losing their job that day, and they're worried about how they're going to make rent and how they're going to feed their children and so on, and they're just unavailable for a few moments. Or even setting aside those things, the parent who has never seen others around them do this, so they don't know that they're supposed to smile and talk to their child, and they're saying to themselves, isn't my child better off in front of this educational DVD because I struggled in school? Look at how, where I ended up. What is my child going to learn from me? The answer is your child is going to learn a lot from you, but they don't know that and they don't recognize that until we help them see themselves in that, in that way. So we need to make sure we're enhancing those experiences because that's what's helping the brain to wire. There's no app, there's no DVD that does this in a child under three years of age. And we need to make sure that parents are hearing that, irrespective of the claims that are being made out there by the manufacturers of these products. Another slide I shared with you was about where we can make a difference for children. And in one of these is a nugget of what I'm going to spend most of my time on, on today. The first thing that, that Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center on the Developing Child said, if, if we're going to focus on different kind of conceptual areas, was that we need to reduce these emotional and behavioral barriers that, that kids have to learning. There's, there's too many kids with wonderful, amazing intellects that we'll never see because there's too many issues layered on top of that, that they'll, they'll never perform well in school despite them being intelligent and smart and all that stuff. But it was in this second one that I think that, I, that, is, that something really important is there. That we need to transform the lives of children by enhancing the lives of their parents. Children live in families. Now, that's an obvious statement, but it's a statement that we sometimes don't think about. And we don't think about when we are thinking sometimes about programs and, and, and policy and so on, that it's very hard to transform the lives of children if we solely focus on the child. We need to make sure that we're so focusing on their parents as well, not just because the parents are an influence on the child, but also because the parents in and of themselves are worth focusing on. And I'll come to some research that's very interesting about that in a few moments. But the idea here is that if the parents are the main driver of those neurons and those skills that are being built in that child, why wouldn't we focus on the immediate environment? You know, it's like saying if a building's ceiling is in danger of caving in because the walls are structurally unsound, well, fix the walls. 
You know, don't just simply start taking bamboo poles and you know, propping up the, the ceiling, hoping that it won't continue to fall. You might do that on a short-term basis, but you need to fix the, the walls that are supposed to be bearing the load there. And then, of course, recognizing that everything we do is fundamentally about health and well-being, not just those of us who, who inhabit the healthcare system. I'm going to share a video with you um, that uh, summarizes a lot of these concepts. This is from the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative in, in Canada. They've done fantastic work. Um, and this is uh, about these concepts of toxic stress and so on. But look also for the mentions of how what happens to parents uh, end up influencing a lot of what goes on. Uh, the video is, is one of its titles is Brain Builders. Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. So again, I think that highlights the, what, what goes on in the brain in terms of the connections that need to happen in children that need to develop, and they need to have these things modeled and patterned for them um, from their caregivers as they move along. Now, that leads us to say, okay, but what about the parents that we see that aren't necessarily doing a fantastic job in terms of modeling those things? 
what can we do to change them? Because, you know, it, we all walk around and we say, oh, wow, there's this brain plasticity in these infants, right? We know that the brain is plastic and if we don't get to things early, it's going to be a problem later on and, and, and so on and so forth. But what if we said, are there other areas, other times in someone's life where the brain is plastic, where we can build new skills much more easily than we can at other times in life? Well, one of those happens to be adolescence, okay? And I think many people recognize that, that adolescents have such <laughs> wonderfully disorganized brains, partly because so much is rewiring and coming together. Um, and that can be both um, a wonderful thing as well as absolutely maddening for those of us who are their parents. I have two at home, so I, I deal with this every day. But the other thing is, there's research now showing that actually there's modeling, remodeling going on in the brains of new parents. And this is done by a colleague of mine at, uh, in Denver, uh, Sarah Watamura, and her lab, where they're actually showing, based on rat models and then MRI studies of, of uh, humans, that there's a third open window, as they call it, where the brain is remodeling in new parents. Now, this is fascinating because this is, again, biologically a deep argument for saying why we should be doing so much with new parents, because they're at a critical period themselves where we might have more effic efficacy in making a difference and warding off some of the mental health, some of the substance abuse issues, et cetera, and building those skills that they need in, and want for to be good parents to their children. And I'll walk you through a little bit of what she said, and the, the report is, uh, is, is available online um, uh, at the uh, Aspen Institute. But she said, look, parents, especially first-time parents, report high levels of anxiety and concern during you know, the first year of their child's life. Duh, that's, we, that's not news. We all, we all knew that. But this is also compounded by the fact that even in families that don't have high levels of risk factor, you throw in sleep deprivation, you throw in new financial demands, you know, the relationship between the parents has now changed because of this new little being there, and so on. That makes the anxiety even worse, of course. It heightens all of this. We also know from other studies that difficulty in managing the stress is associated with a few potential negative outcomes, like the risk for harsh parenting, yelling at the child, being overly, discipline, uh, overly disciplining a child, and so on. Relationship difficulties, not just between the parents, but also between the parent and the child. And of course, serious postmortem mood disorders. Um, that risk all goes up when these things aren't handled well. What she focused on and found through her research, and I won't go into the, the details of the research itself, but there were three circuits in the brain that she said that she found were, were changed significantly in new parents. So there was one called the reward circuit, right? This is you do something and you feel a reward, you know, you feel good feelings, et cetera, um, inside your brain. And they found that there was more growth in these new parents. And this is both mothers and fathers, okay? So it's not just in the mom that we're seeing this. And it was associated with the more positive feelings that they reported about their baby, my baby's beautiful, my baby's perfect, and so on. We saw that the reward circuit actually was larger. And again, she's showing this on MRI studies and, and so on, so we're seeing physical changes there. And there was more activity in the brain when they looked at pictures of their own infant versus other infants. So there was also a very specific cue to looking at their own infants. Now, another circuit that was affected was something called the social information circuit. Um, this is how we convey things to, to one another. So if I suddenly were to stop and start frowning towards the back of the room, you would say, wait, he's telling us there's something going on back there that, that you know, he, he doesn't like. That's what we call social information. You know, I'm passing that on in some way that's not necessarily just verbal or written. And um, they found that there was growth in that. So this is great because your baby can't talk to you, right? So you need to use social information to understand their cries. Think about this. Many of us have seen parents who, there's a young baby with them, they're talking to us, the baby cries, and the parent takes a bottle and immediately puts it in the kid's mouth. Well, was that a hunger cry? Or was that a mom, please pick me up cry? Or was it a I need my diaper change cry? Are they using their social information circuits to try to distinguish between those different needs in a child who can't yet say, this is what my need is, and clearly convey that? So this understanding of infants' emotions and so on is, is helped by that, by that circuit if it's given the right stimulation and the right support. Again, this is working on the parent. This has nothing to do with changing the child. This has to do with, with helping the parent and helping grow these things. And then, finally, the third one 
obviously, so in this same period, there's other stressors that happen, and the, they found that there was less reactivity to some of the physical reactivity to these stressors. So this was about regulating emotions. There was actually some growth in the emotion regulation circuits, um, which showed that they were less likely to be bothered by outside factors because they were focusing on their parenting. Because the one area that actually was heightened was actually their looking at uh, uh, listening to infant cries, which makes sense. You want them to pay attention to their infant and, and not so much. So we saw that there was all sorts of complex interrelated brain changes when we worked with when, when there were new parents that were being worked with in a variety of ways. So again, think about that, not so much in, okay, what circuit turns on and what part of the brain does this and all, but that when we work with new parents, we have a chance, we have a, an open opportunity to help build some of these skills that really will have great outcomes for all of them, you know, not just the child, but for the parent as well. Okay, so there's a, there's a quote I want to share with you. This is from Paul Krugman, who's a columnist uh, in the, with the New York Times. And he highlights this saying, my personal obsession right now is how disconnected we are from what we really need to be talking about with poverty. We talk about work or training for parents, or we talk about early childhood for kids. But I don't see how we can help the children without trying to help their parents as well. We need to have a serious national discussion about helping families together. And this is fundamentally the, the, the concept that leads to what we call two-generation approaches. And I'm very proud to have, in the last year, uh, been associated with uh, the Aspen Institute's ASCEND program. Uh, Aspen Institute is based in, uh, in Washington, D.C. They do a variety of work in a million different areas that are actually quite disparate. But the ASCEND program focuses specifically on two-generation approaches. And I was named one of their ASCEND fellows for their, the, the current class. And um, I'll talk a bit about what Ascend is really looking at, not because I'm here to sell you on Ascend or anything, but to really say this is actually where conceptually thinking about what does it mean to have truly two-generation focused approaches? Because I think that's what your report is getting at. And I want to give you this conceptual frame to, as, as you receive it and read through it and think about it. Fundamentally, they say, we envision an America in which a legacy of economic security and educational success passes from one generation to the next. You notice it doesn't say anything about poverty or anything like that, that this economic success, a security, educational success, irrespective of where you are in the socioeconomic spectrum, should be something that is passed on from generation to generation, and we want that to happen. And uh, you saw earlier there was a nice continuum uh, line that, was, that, that you'll see in the report. Well, we all like continuum lines. And this talks about the continuum of two generations. So on the left, well, this is kind of as a pediatrician, this is where I have, I have sat and still to some extent sit because I look at children. That's what I'm trained to do and it's, it's what I spend a lot of time doing. There are my colleagues who focus solely on the parents and they're thinking only about the, the adults. You can start to get towards, you know, parent-focused with child elements. You can start to get child-focused with parent elements. But this is the whole family approach that to the two-generation model tries to really get to. How do we make sure we're truly addressing the needs of not just children, not just parents, or not just children as routes to the parents or parents as routes to the children, but really saying, let's work with the whole family. Let's treat them all as important in and of themselves. And that's really where the two-generation approach is, is, is important. And it really is about putting the whole family on a path to economic security through a variety of different things. So key components in, in this framework, um, there's really four of them, and, and I'll walk through them a, a little bit here. One is education, and, and it, we'll talk about that in, in more detail, not just education for the child, not just education for the parent, but thinking about them, them all together. Economic supports that are critical for that family to be able to function. Health and well-being. And then finally, social capital, which is a more nebulous concept, but is something that is so important to recognizing how we can make a big difference. So let's start by looking first at education. You know, there's a few key facts nationally. Ten, only 10% 10 of individuals who have a bachelor's degree live in poverty. Okay, so it tells you that there's something about that attaining of a bachelor's degree that is protective against poverty to a large extent. Because greater than 30% of those with only a high school diploma live in poverty. 
Okay, so we know that there's something about the education process that's certainly an, an part of anti-poverty initiatives. We also know that the more educated moms are, that you see better kindergarten school readiness in those kids. So again, we, we see these connections between what happens in the parent, what happens with the child, and the difference that these sorts of make. So here's the problem, however, in terms of the world of education. That adult education, this is often community colleges, et cetera, tend to view children as a barrier to participation. Okay? Um, I think some of you may have seen some of the photos that have, have popped up here and there in the last year on social media and, 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 and news sources of the professor who has a student show up you know, with her two children in tow for final exams and say, my sitter didn't show up, what do I do? And the professor says, here, I'll play with your children while you take your final. You know, and then that makes the rounds and all. And great, that's wonderful that the professor's done that. Why should that even have to be an issue, right? Why should that have to happen? Why should this parent have to choose between, oh my God, what do I do with my kids and I have to get this final exam you know, done and, and so on. So are we truly doing more than just mere, oh, we offer some occasional childcare when we try to enroll students in community colleges and things like that who, who are working parents? Childhood education, on the other hand, and I'm guilty of this, of thinking this way as well, we tend to view parents as facilitators of children's learning, right? The parents are there to focus on the kid and focus on the kid and focus on the kid, but we don't often ask ourselves, but what are we doing around the parents' own education, their own economic success? What are we doing to encourage them for their own betterment? Because we know that will help the family unit as, as a whole. So what we need are whole family approaches that really consider the needs of the children and consider the needs of the parents as well. Because the return on investment is quite good. I told you last time quite clearly how early childhood education is a fantastic economic investment and has, and has great returns. But we also know that a college degree on average doubles the income of parents. Great. You know, and then that's more resources they have to be able to use to better their own lives and to better the lives of their children. So education and educational approaches that are actually approaching both are, are good things. This also means when you have more income, you solve that, you know, hopefully that income circle, but you're also helping in terms of substance abuse and mental health needs in terms of those supports. You're able to get all these things together. Now let's think about economic supports. Economic supports are, you know, they're the, the, the source of a lot of controversy in our society because we say, oh, you know, how much are we just giving people and so on. These are supports. They're not something that's meant for someone to live on and virtually no one can live on econ the economic supports that are offered. What they fundamentally do is that it allows parents to be able to build skills, okay? That if you are able with a little help to now go and take that night class or that weekend class or whatever it is so you build more skills and are able to be more employable, great. Then we've just gotten a better return on that, on that economic support. Better jobs, long-term financial stability is good for the parents, it's good for the child, it's good for all of us. So what are these sorts of things? You know, this is looking at, again, think about Maslow's hierarchy again, all right? Some of this is basic things, things like housing and food. You know, some are a little bit higher in terms of education and so on. Some are about helping do financial education and asset building. If you've never had enough money to be able to put any of it away, you may have absolutely no idea how to actually save and how to actually invest money because it has never even been in the realm of possibility. People sometimes ask, why in the world would anyone go into one of those you know, rent-to-own shops, right, and buy a television there because you end up paying so much more than if you just saved up and bought the television at you know, a standard store. Well, it's not about not doing the math. It's about not even having the concept of how you can possibly save up. So instead, having someone else put that frame on it for you and rip you off in the process um, is, is much more attainable than it is in other ways. So, this is about that sort of financial thinking, about saving up, about aiming, about setting goals, and all those sorts of things. And we know that economic supports make a difference. And I'm gonna get child-focused again here for a moment because this is the area I know best. But the United Kingdom's war on child poverty is actually very instructive. So, you know, we, we, we love to look at and tell stories about, you know, what the Scandinavian countries have done about X, Y, or Z, and, uh, and so on. 
But the fact is that their social structure is also somewhat different from ours. But if you look at the UK, which is arguably the, the society aside from Canada that is closest to what we have in the United States, the child poverty rate in the UK was higher than that of the United States in the mid-90s by several percentage points. And the government at the time said, okay, we, we can't continue with this. We, we need to make sure that, that ch children should not be this poor. We need to bring this down. And they declared a war on child poverty and, you know, there's all the fanfare. But they actually did follow through. And they did a number of things. They did things like mandated paid parental uh, paternity and maternity leave. Um, they did things like the equivalent of the earned income tax credit. They did things like actually direct cash payments to parents to help in terms of uh, what they needed for their children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they found when they did this multi-band approach of various supports, child poverty plummeted. It plummeted well below that of the United States. And even though it jumped back up a little bit with the Great Recession, it's still much lower. So uh, Jane Waldfogel or Columbia University has written an excellent book about that, what they've done in the UK. Um, and it's very instructive to think about that from the lens of what we might do here. Because what we often do in the US is we do one intervention or maybe two interventions. And then we see a small nudge and we say, oop, didn't work. Oh, well, we didn't do enough. When what we need are multi-band interventions. You heard earlier about how these are complex issues. They are extraordinarily complex. This is not like polio. You know, polio, okay, we identified a virus, they developed a vaccine, and they figured out how to get that out there to the world at large, and we're on the verge of eliminating polio from the world. Great. There's no vaccine. It's not a single factor. It's not this one virus. These are really, really complicated things that we're talking about. This is not like trying to, trying to solve polio. And we need to be careful of what we do in terms of how we implement economic supports. This graph is very telling. Um, I've, I've heard this conceptually, and I, I came across this graph. This is what happens as your income goes up from about 16,000 a year you know, up here to um, 64,000 a year. And this is your net monthly resources. And you see, see how much money you have available to you each month. As you go up, sure, the line goes up. And then, oh, you get these drops. And these drops are as different el eligibility for different supports. Um, uh, uh, gets lost. And you can see there's some precipitous drops here. You're actually worse off in terms of your monthly cash flow at $44,000 $44, um, a year than you were when you were poorer because of the way we do this. Once you hit a certain point, we say, oh, you're no longer eligible for this. There's not the soft landing, so to speak. So you can imagine a parent who's struggling and then they're starting to do better and they're feeling great, I've got a better job, I've got more income, this is wonderful, I'm starting to save. And then we pull the rug out from under them and say, oh, you're no longer eligible for this. And suddenly, I mean, especially, and you see the huge hit that, that housing assistance and childcare assistance you know, represents. This is quite, quite substantial. So we need to think about how we also don't make things harder for people as, as, as they move along. Because again, economic supports help, and they can also help in terms of children. Um, for low and, and, and moderate income children, when they're actually given s relatively small college savings account, accounts, they're actually three times more likely to go to college. And they're more, four times more likely to graduate from college. Now, it's not that college is so cheap that throwing a few dollars at it is gonna suddenly make it, make it feasible. It's also the message it sends, by the way, we think you're going to go to college. We want you to go to college. That's very different from when someone says to you, uh, I don't know how you're going to afford college. Yeah, we don't have anything saved. We didn't expect that would happen is the message they're sending there. I won't focus too long on health and well-being because I, I've, I've said many, much about that before, the, the consequences that are on physical and mental health and learning. And you may remember this pyramid, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Pyramid, that we understand that disease, disability, and social problems cause early death. And it's these different health risk behaviors that lead to that. But the bottom of the pyramid is where there's still so much to be learned about what, are, what does adversity do in terms of playing out on, on top of the pyramid there, uh, and, and so on, and toxic stress and all those concepts. The last area was that of social capital. And again, thinking about these connections. In the video you saw earlier on aging, there was the comment about 
seniors and the time they had available and thinking about how do we draw seniors back out into the community, not just for the skills and knowledge and wisdom that they have, but also to engage them and to connect up people. That's really about social capital. And social capital is about concepts like peer support. Are there those around you who are like you saying, yeah, I've been there, hey, I can help you out, those sorts of things. Um, it's about contact with those around you. I have some families who don't have any relatives, they've just moved to town, they don't know anyone. They have a hard time getting help when their kid's sick and they need to go to work. And you know, where do they go, where do they turn to? Versus patients of mine who have extended family units and they can call any one of a number of people to help out. It's also about participating in community organizations, including faith-based initiatives and so on. It's about having contacts at school and workplace. It's about being able to effectively use case managers and coaches as a resource and not someone who tells you what to do, but to actually ask them for help and to be able to use them as, as that resource. It's about social networks, and I'm not talking about Twitter and Facebook, um, but it's about who you know and who you can turn, on, uh, turn to. And then, of course, mental health services. As networks expand, so do resources and support. And, and this is astoundingly, this issue of social capital is, is actually quite astounding. Um, how many people in this room were the first in their family to go to college? Okay, so a fair number of hands, yeah. So I think that, this isn't true in all cases, but I think that when no one in your family has been to college and understands this concept of higher education and, and and the whole system that we have in higher education, it's sometimes hard because you don't know who to turn to when you need advice or help that tells you how to actually work with the system and how to, how to fight the system when the system needs fighting. Um, my parents didn't go to college. And when I struggled in um, my undergraduate years, I, they were not a source of support. They were well-meaning, but they didn't, say, they didn't tell me anything that actually would have been useful in terms of dealing with the struggles I had, some of which were simply bureaucratic struggles. In complete contrast, my daughter's had a few health issues this year, and she's in middle school. And once it became clear that the system was not taking care of itself, you know, email started to go to the teachers, and things subtly improved, and then some things didn't happen. So then dad shows up and goes and talks to the principal, and suddenly, mysteriously, things get fixed, right? But this is because I know how to fight that system. I know how to get to the right people, and I know how to make the points in a clear, organized manner, and I know who to turn to. I've had not one but two advisees who were not actually formal advisees, but were making rather rookie mistakes in their applications to medical school in, when it came to being able to afford application fees and where they were applying and so on. And I was horrified to discover that they actually had gotten very little help from the pre-med advising office because they didn't know what questions to ask. And the pre-med advising offices have way too many students to deal with it, so they can't customize and tailor their advice as much. And when I, and I was trying not to kind of, I'm like, hey, you know, this, my job is not actually to be a med school application advisor. I was trying not to take over. I, we had, he and I had done some research together, so that's how I knew him. And when I discovered what was going on, I said, okay, I, I need to sit down with you. And we sat down and we, we've mapped out a strategy. He's now a third year medical student is doing fantastic as I, as I expected. But no one in his, in his family had ever gone to college. No one knew anything about financial aid waivers, application fee waivers, et cetera. It was a complete, complete news to him. And it wasn't clear to him that he was eligible. He actually felt, no, no, isn't that for people who really need it? And I just looked at him and said, you really need it, really, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and so on. So, Again, these are the things that social capital brings that you can't just easily measure, uh, measure so much. In terms of applications, you know, we, we do, how do we do, do all this? We do it through programs, we do it through policies, we think about the systems we build, and then there's, then there's the research. And we're hoping to kind of grow those all you know, through two generation approaches. But I want to say one clear thing is that this is not to argue that all of you with the organizations you're part of or represent or whatever, need to go home and say, all right, we need to start doing everything two generations. Not, not necessarily. To do these sorts of things, there's, there's kind of three big ways in which you can make a difference. One is you can build the program, right? You can say, wow, we are not actually addressing the needs of parents, and we should be. We are not addressing the needs of children, and we should be. We are going to build the program. We're going to modify what we do, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
So you just do it yourself. However, sometimes that's not in your skill set or in your wheelhouse or whatever, and that's okay. You can buy those things, right? You can contract, contract with someone else. You can say, hey, we have no clue how to run a child care center, but we're going to contract with someone else who can come in and do it for us. And that way, we're getting what we need without having to do, learn a new skill set ourselves that we just don't have the experience in. Or you can broker. You can say, there's a great organization out there. They know how to do this, but my goodness, they need, they need a fiscal agent. They need a sponsor. They need someone to get, they need office space, you know, in order to be able to grow. Any of those sorts of things. All of these are approaches that help. I'm not arguing that you need to start all of a sudden transforming all your programming to be to gen an approach, but think about who else around you can be helped. What can you buy? What can you broker for them in a variety of ways? Now, of course, as you know, I talk a lot about early literacy, so I can't come, come here and not talk a bit about, about, about reading and, and what that is, because I've come to recognize that when we, share with, when we have parents share books with their children, that is fundamentally a two-generation approach, because it's not just about the child. There are benefits that feed back to, to the parents. And that's why, so my colleague Perry Class, who's National Medical Director of Reach Out and Read, uh, uttered this wonderful statement uh, at a talk I was at that reading is a triumph of the early brain, okay, because of all that brain circuitry and, and oral language skills and motor skills and vision and all the things that have to come together. And we know that when a child is reading and reading on time, that all this stuff happened well and it happened beautifully and it's just one of those expressions of, of what the early brain is capable of. Well, I want to modify her, her, her splendid, delightful statement just a little bit here to say that also reading is not just a triumph of the early brain, it's also a triumph of two generations because it says there was another generation there besides that of the child that provided that structure and that support across countless upon countless hours over, over time. And you've heard me speak before briefly about the Reach Out and Read program where we give out books in early uh, in, in pediatrician and family medicine offices during those regular checkups and talk to families about the importance of reading and look to see the connections and look to see what the child is doing and look at the parent's response and, and, and so on. And I will just say it is, again, about how do we build skills in the adults fundamentally? How do we teach them to interact with their child? But how do we also help them think about their own role and about their own selves as I'm able to be a teacher to my child. That it's really getting at that uh, as, as much as it is what's going on inside the child's brain. Um, and I, I will just throw in here that, you know, since we founded Reach Out and Read Wisconsin in 2010, where we had about 50 sites um, throughout the state that had popped up on their own, we have been resoundingly successful and uh, more and more sites are opening all throughout the state. We're actually now at 156, I think, is the, 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 the latest number. We did a study last, last summer, um, a medical student and I, uh, one of our MD, MPH students, and uh, we looked at what was the effect on parents of having programs like Reach Out and Read, and we did this through a survey process, um, looking at clinics that had the Reach Out and Read program and, and those who did. Um, and it was really surveys around their knowledge, attitudes, and what behaviors they were doing at home around early literacy. And we saw, consistent with previous studies that were out there, that uh, parents who were exposed to the Reach Out and Read model said they were more likely to state that they should begin reading to their child at, uh, at or earlier than six months of age. So great that messaging was getting across. They were more likely to mention reading as a way to prepare their child to uh, succeed in school. So they were having that vision of their child as, yes, they can do well in school and, and so on. And this is, this is tremendously important. However, and here's why I'm sharing this with you, is that as much as I think our model uh, that Reach Out and Read is fantastic and wonderful, the biggest variable we saw, the biggest variable was parental education. That actually more profoundly affected the results that we saw because those who had a high school or, or, uh, or below education when compared to those who had post-secondary education, so any kind of college, they were more likely to report reading is a favorite activity that I do with my child, that reading is a part of our bedtime routine, that this is something we do around school readiness, and that we should be reading to our child at a young age, and so on. And they had more than five 
children's books in their home and, and so on, and reading happened greater than five days per week. So reach out and read is a small, cheap intervention. I mean, you know, it, it does a lot for the amount that we spend on it. But we also need to think about these big picture things like the education of the parents and so on, because that is going to push things even further. Now, for the 50 bucks or so that it costs to implement Reach Out and Read with one child, you're not going to be able to get a, get a parent through college, right? We, that, that, that's pretty obvious. But it speaks to the types of outcomes that we're seeing even in relatively small studies like what we were doing. And thinking again about programs like Reach Out and Read in this two-generation frame, there's a lot we do with it. And I like to think of the, 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 old, the old parable about the elephant and the blind men. And uh, the, the, uh, the blind men are feeling the elephant. And one of them says, oh, they're feeling the leg, and says, oh, I feel like this is you know, a tree trunk. And somebody else feels the, the tail and says, I feel like this is a brush. Well, in, in this parable, I like to think of programs that really address things in a multi-band approach, like Richard and Reed, are, are fundamentally that elephant. Because there's a lot we can do with them that address the needs of children, that, affect the, that address the needs of, of, family, of parents, and that really affect the whole family. Because yes, we're giving away books, but we're also intervening um, in terms of education priorities. We're also looking at children's development. We're also building the capacity of parents to do that good dialogic reading, that back and forth, that serve and return, using that book as a, as a, as a scaffold. Um, it's also about buffering that toxic stress. You know, when you sit with your child, I mean, I, I still read to my kids many nights. Uh, we just finished a, a, a novel um, that took us several weeks to get through. And, you know, I have my, my son kind of on one side and my daughter, and she always leans up against me and so on. And even at the end of a busy day, it's that wonderful, okay, we're, we're doing something, and oh, yes, and my children are not bickering or squabbling with one another, uh, and, and so on. It's a way to address, assess the relationships in the families. Do they know how to interact with each other? Do they seem to be responsive to one another and, and, and all those things? It's using these things in this broad public health approach. And of course, it's scalable and, and evidence-based and, and all that. So when we think about interventions that take these, that hit multiple aspects, that you know, it's not just any one of these things, of course, that when it comes down to it, it's, it's all of these things. So because this isn't broadly recognized, what we did was uh, we actually took this, these concepts I just told you around early literacy promotion. And uh, we actually wrote a report on it um, that uh, we, we called, surprise, surprise, the elephant in the clinic. Um, and uh, using this parable as a framework to say, what can we do around these two generation strategies and all? Um, and it's available at that URL. Um, uh, and it's, it's free download from the, from the Ascend at the Aspen Institute, uh, really thinking, again, how can we leverage different groups, including healthcare, to be able to make, make these differences out there? So there's a lot that we've covered today, um, a lot about thinking about families, thinking about children, thinking about parents. And again, the dominant message that I really want to get across here is that we need to take broad-based approaches to being able to address these complicated issues that are identified as, as priorities. And these are priorities in so many communities. Um, and and I, I applaud you for taking a good look at them because I think they, may, they are something that is so critical to both short-term as well as medium and long-term outcomes. If we're going to do the best for kids, if we're going to do the best for our society and our society's future, it's going to be through thinking about ways that we can really affect all of these things and move, move the needle carefully. I'm going to close with a quote um, that is a slightly lengthy, but, but I think is very telling about aspects of what it means when we intervene, and intervene in, in the appropriate manner um, overall. Um, this is from Monique Reiser, who's a, now the chief of staff at a group called Be the Change. I wish that leaders and policymakers understood first that the investment in parents and children struggling to achieve economic security is just that an investment. As a country, we need to think long term. I also believe that that investment is not enough. Families struggling to achieve economic security need basic assistance, but they also need an advocate by their side, mentors, people to whom they can turn for, for advice and perspective. I have found that decisions I made for my family over time have less to do with seeking basic assistance and more to do with learning how to manage the resources I was given and make good lifelong decisions. 
I've seen people in my immediate family growing up, six siblings, make critical decisions with little information or guidance. Our parents didn't know how to guide us, so we were also on our own. It is a vicious cycle. It took me 10 years to really get to a place of economic security, even with my education. It doesn't happen overnight, and it takes patience, commitment, and the ability to delay gratification to see the bigger picture. And I always close most of my talks with this. This is my wife reading to my son. I caught them years ago in this beautiful moment of being lost in a book together. And I think, again, from the two-generation lens, what's encapsulated in this photograph? It's my son taking in the words, the story. It's the warmth and security he feels when he's sitting there. It's looking at those words, those funny black marks, and recognizing that those actually convey information. But it's also, for my wife, that wonderful moment of being able to share something with him, of being able to impart knowledge, of being able to impart love by, being, by holding him and being together. And sharing, actually, this is in her, her own parents' home, um, and it's one of the books from her own childhood bedroom. And to really transmit that legacy of safety and security onto her, to him. And a lot of that is encapsulated here. And I, I hope and wish that for every child and for every family and for every parent that in, in all communities. This is my social media and email address if anyone has, uh, um, wants to follow along on any of those things. And with that, I think we're going on to some questions at this point. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for your interest in all of this stuff. <laughs> Does anybody have a question for our speaker? Given that you have parents who may very well not be succeeding as they'd like to as parents because they themselves lacked the kind of role models that would not only teach them but would inspire them to feel that they could succeed. And given the fact that we all tend to some degree to gravitate back to those people, those groups that accept us as we are, and that this need to be accepted, uh, to have that social security as in the Maslow uh, hierarchy, given that that's fundamental, how can we as a community, how can we as schools and employers um, inspire parents to want to change, to want to uh, look for and accept uh, the kind of help that is available or should be available and that can help them achieve uh, the goal of uh, being better parents? That's a fantastic question, and I, I think there's a couple of ways one can approach that. One is higher up on Maslow's hierarchy than the need to be accepted also is that whole concept of, of self-actualization, of feeling that you yourself are making a difference, that you yourself are improving and bettering yourself. And for a lot of folks that are kind of stuck down there, they don't really have access to thinking about that level of the pyramid. So if we can get to this point where we say, hey, you know, we think, we, we believe that you can actually do more, that you're capable of more. And we're going to try to lift some of those burdens from you so you're not having to think about, you know, rent and food and things like that, that that's not this daily struggle, this daily worry. People will sometimes come around. And you can start off with small successes. You know, look for the, hey, we need a parent helper in the classroom. I know it's hard for you to do that during the day because of X. Well, if we were able to free you up to do to, so that you could come, do you think you could help us out? And then that becomes sort of this intentional skill building. And once they have that taste of that success, you know, I think fundamentally everyone wants to be successful and they want to better themselves. The question is, do they see themselves as being able to do that? And I think that will help them get there once they're able to move up a little bit, so, so to speak, on, on the pyramid. It's not easy. Because when you know, we think about, we, uh, you know, think about substance abuse treatment programs, right? We, we success, successfully have someone you know, graduate from a rehab program, and if they go right back into the community and the pressures and so on, 
where they, the pressure to use again is there, well, what, what have we accomplished? You know, have we really accomplished a lot there? So some of this is also around fundamentally changing the, 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 the pressures around them. The other thing is that children are a very strong motivator for parents. Children want to actually, the parents want their children to do well, even if they don't believe that they themselves are, if they think they themselves are a lost cause. So asking, I've, I've started now at the four month well child visit, just simply asking parents, what do you hope your child is going to be like in 20 years? And then the shutting up and listening, which we're not very good at in medicine, right? So, and looking to see what they say, and I hope they say things like, I hope they're educated and successful and happy and all those things, because if they're not, then we need to start talking about something that, those, those things. And then I ask, so, what are you doing now that you think will get your child to that place in 20 years? And if they say, well, gee, I don't know, is there anything I can do? Okay, great, we have a topic for conversation, they asked. Or, if I hope they're saying, well, I talk and I read and I sing and I play with him, great. And then I can reinforce that and say, and give them a vision of the future that is not just about next week, because that's often the loop that they're caught in. How do I keep next week? How do I keep next week? Not thinking 20 years. And then if they start to recognize that things they're doing are actually potentially holding back their child from achieving that, that vision they have, okay, now they're strongly motivated to make a difference. Parents are more likely to tell us that they themselves can't read or read well when we talk about reading to their children because they suddenly recognize that they're hampering their own child's growth and they'll, they'll reveal it. They will not reveal it to their own doctors. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. On this page, uh, we have the web address for the United Way site, and, and this is where you can access uh, the report online. And in closing, I would just uh, urge you all to take some form of action. Get involved, you know, book a speaker uh, from United Way to, or the Life Committee to uh, get information about the Life Report out there uh, broad, more broadly in the community. Etc. Um, one person can make a difference, but many people working together surely will make a difference. And if we continue to pool our resources, our intellect, our money, and collaborate on these issues, we can make significant progress in ensuring that this continues to be a great community to live and work and raise a family. So with that, thank you very much for coming out this morning. Again, you can pick up copies of the Life Report and the snapshot on the way out. Thank you again.